Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started, um, even as some of our other colleagues arrive. On behalf of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Arts, Building Bridges Program, and our colleagues at the Bradamer Center of New York University and Grant Makers in the Arts and Philanthropy New York, a warm welcome to all of you in the room. And for those of you who are watching live stream, welcome too. Uh, to join us further in the conversation, we have a hashtag, and you can meet us on Twitter and tweet there. Uh, it's stories, hashtag stories transform. We look forward to continuing the conversation in the ether. And uh, before going any further, a special thank you to everyone who helped to organize this symposium, especially Alberta Arthurs. Is Alberta here? Um, she'll be here very soon. Michael Denicia and Tom McIntyre, as well as Kevin Mel uh, Melman, and also Linda Artola and Jeremy Williams. It's been really great teamwork. Thank you again. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the Building Bridges program. Our mission is to advance relationships and increase understanding between American Muslims and the broader non-Muslim community. Um, and this is for mutual well-being. And uh, for our work, we take a collaborative approach, joining grantees, um, colleague funders, practitioners, thinkers, wherever we can to really expand uh, as a learning commons um, and to strengthen our critical thinking and our ideas and also our bonds. And the hope is that we can also find um, ways in which to collaborate together. Uh, it's always much richer that way. In addition to grant making activities, we also organize convenings and um, we do that for knowledge sharing, increased engagement and connections, um, and more than anything else to just listen, 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 and absorb um, as actively as possible. The Bradham Center is a frequent partner because of its core belief in the power of the arts to bring on cross, a cross-pollination of ideas and action that help to shape critical thinking and to do so for social change. And this reminds me of something uh, that Jack Jenkins at the Center for American Progress wrote about the power of music and art and community events. And he said that artists have become an important educational and experiential force that can break down stereotypes and allow Muslims and non-Muslims alike to, a chance to interact, and in doing so, to better understand each other. So today's, um, today's gathering follows a 2017 symposium on the roles of arts and culture in addressing Islamophobia. It gathered together peer funders. Many of you are in the room. It's great to see you here. Um, and to learn about best practices to overcome bigotry towards our Muslim, Arab, and South Asian, or Massa community, as they're known. We heard from artists, we heard from cultural practitioners and activists, and others in philanthropy about both the successes and the challenges they faced as they undertook this work. That gathering sparked a series of activities that have continued to today. Creative and institutional connections led to new partnerships and similar convenings that have been held in different parts of the country. Um, a set of shared resources was created, and it started with the Bradamer Center. They created a summary report of the proceedings from last year, and that kicked off thinking uh, on the Building Bridges team, and we um, inspired, turned around, and created a set of four articles on sub-themes from that day. They're in your folders, um, and they're accompanied by Flash Rosenberg's um, provocative and intriguing um, drawings that she live drew last year. They're also on the symposium website for those of you who are watching on live stream. And we invite your feedback for these articles and, uh, and your ideas about uses for them. So bring them forward um, in, in the break or, or after the, um, our gathering is completed. And another activity took place, another uh, byproduct came out of last year, and that was that 
our keynote, Hussein Rashid's talk, was so popular, so many asked for his presentation and then asked for an edited version of his speech on video um, that we found it was too heavy a file. And again, the Building Bridges uh, team got inspired and we decided to create two short shareable videos that we adapted from the key points that Hussein raised. And the first of them is almost complete. Um, we're in talks with a major publication for its distribution. And that'll be later this fall. We're not allowed to say whom because we're still finalizing details. But we will be sure to share more of that with you um, very soon. But more than anything else, what we learned from last year's symposium is that um, you kept staying in touch with us and kept asking us to do more, more such convenings for more learning. Um, and this brings us to today, um, to this, this um, theme that we have of beyond Islamophobia, how American stories transform communities. It'll build on the 2017 conversations to highlight fresh thinking since last year from artists and cultural practitioners, from activists and funders. And they'll share their ideas about moving beyond that defensive fame of, uh, frame of combating Islamophobia, fighting Islamophobia and bigotry by unique storytelling and aligned activities. So we hope today offers opportunities for discovery. We hope it inspires action and collaboration among all of us for the benefit of our communities. Now, um, more about our speakers are in your folders. They're also on the symposium website for those of you who are on live stream right now. Um, but I did want to point out um, someone who is making a return appearance, a star turn, and that's Flash Rosenberg. She's our graphic facilitator. And Flash, will you come on up so everybody can see you? Um, as you run up here, I'm going to say that Flash is uh, an attention span for hire. She's a Guggenheim Fellow who uses drawing, animation, photography, writing, and performing to accelerate awareness, to entertain, to create consternment, and as always, does it with humor. So here's Flash. She's going to tell us a little bit about what she's going to do today. Yes, in case you're wondering what that strange woman in the back is doing, drawing what it is you're saying, I'm not doing caricatures. I'm trying to make a portrait of the ideas to sort of interpret the complexity of what's being communicated and make it visible so that we have sort of shared icons at the end that sort of make this more memorable. And you'll be able to see the work afterwards, but I just wanted to indicate what I was doing because I'm not just there for the doodle impaired. Also, what it does is it, <laughs> I would invite you to join me as a way of listening because it's not just stump the doodle monkey, like, gee, can I follow it and draw something? What it is is like, I'm trying to say, when you hear an idea, how does it get into us? How do we make it visible? And maybe if the whole, especially this nation, slowed down and tried to understand first before forming an opinion, we bit by bit, person by person, will in fact accelerate understanding. Thanks. Thank you, Flash. And with this, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, historian Zahir Ali. It's fitting that he sets the context for the symposium as it's stories that we tell ourselves and others that form our critical thinking and approach to life. Zahir currently is the oral, oral historian at the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is a nationally recognized urban his, history center founded in the 19th century. Um, it's dedicated to preserving and encouraging the study of Brooklyn. He records, collects, and curates the lived histories, testimonies, memoirs, and narrations of Brooklynites from all walks of life, and currently directs Muslims in Brooklyn, which is a two-year multifaceted project designed to amplify the stories of Brooklyn's Muslim communities and contextualize them in the broader history of Brooklyn. He also co-hosts and co-produces Flatbush Plus Maine, um, and he does it for the Brooklyn Historical Society's monthly podcast that explores Brooklyn's past and present through scholarly discussion, 
historical archives, and oral histories. In addition to Brooklyn, Zahir's scholarly interests include Malcolm X, Prince the Artist, Rogers Nelson, Islam in America, 20th century US history, and last but not least, the African American Muslims, Muslim community's beloved dessert, the bean pie. <laughs> so now please join me in welcoming Zahir Ali. Thank you so much, Zeba, for that um, introduction. And now you make me regret that I didn't bring bean pie, <laughs> but <laughs> next time, that's, that's incentive for you guys to have me back. Um, I'm very excited to talk on this topic, how American stories can transform or transform our communities, because as an oral historian, it is exactly what we are committed to doing. And I also like the frame of moving beyond the defensive posture. Um, and I'd like to start off with a quote from Toni Morrison. And this is from a speech she gave in 1975 at Portland State University, where she says, uh, know the function, the very serious function of racism, which is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, and so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says that you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says that you have no kingdoms, and so you dredge that up. None of that is necessary. There will always be one more thing. And I think this is fitting for us as we think about um, how we contend with Islamophobia, that there will always be one more thing. That isn't to say that we don't do this work, but we, we should not um, ignore the other important aspects of our work. And from this, I take inspiration from the late Manning Marable, who was my mentor, who described the work of African American studies in three parts. He said, first, it's corrective. Correcting the misconceptions that people have had about African Americans, restoring lost histories. He said, second, it is descriptive, actually describing what black life is. And third, it is prescriptive, imagining what life could be. And I think as we move beyond just correcting the stereotypes and misconceptions that people have of, as Muslims, of Muslims, that it is important for us to focus on this descriptive work. And it is even more important for us to imagine what the future holds and what we can you know, create together as a, a new society. Um, I want to give a shout out to a recent report. This was just released yesterday, um, Hawk and Hollywood, 100 Years of Muslim Tropes and How to Transform Them. This has been published by the Pop Culture Collaborative, um, authored by one of my um, colleagues, Dr. Maitha Al-Hassan. And I think this helps bridge both the corrective work, but also the prescriptive work in terms of what we can do. And so everyone's talking about stories. Everyone's talking about narrative change. This is the big buzzword that we came across as we were looking for funding for our project. And I want us to think about really what do we mean when we talk about stories and the role that they play in narrative change. Um, oftentimes, we are focused on representation and authenticity. We want representative voices from the community. We want authentic narratives, um, narratives and stories that are real. But I want to add a third thing that we should think of, and that is intimate knowledge. And the reason why I want to suggest intimate knowledge is because intimate knowledge of the life of the community suggests a closeness. It suggests a relationship. It suggests that we are, uh, you know, that you're talking to and engaging with people who are actually in the community, who have relationships with the community, and so they can offer this intimate knowledge of, of life. Um, and so I want to play a clip of an oral history um, and, and from our collection at Brooklyn Historical Society. 
and it is from a woman named Mildred Pearson. Mildred Pearson was uh, a, she, a woman who founded a group called Mother's Love, which was a, a support group for mothers of men who died of, or who were suffering and died of HIV. This oral history is from a collection that Brooklyn Historical Society did in 1992. Um, so I'm going to play. It's a really short clip. And in the practice of listening, I want you to, whatever you're doing, put it down. Um, if you need to close your eyes, do that. But I want you to focus and hone in on what she is saying. Uh, unfortunately, we, we're not, we don't have the sound, but I want to tell you what she says. Um, she describes in her oral history that she was one of the, her group was one of the first groups to go into Muslim mosques. This is in 1992, and talk about HIV. And she talked about a woman in this support group whose son was Muslim and who came back home because his, you know, his, his marriage had broken up as a result of his diagnosis. And he came back home to his mother and his mother would help him make his prayer because he was ill. And um, his mother would cook in, uh, prepare his food in different pots because, you know, Muslims uh, dietary restrictions, not eating pork or food prepared with pork. And the reason why I wanted to play this, and she says, you know, these are the kinds of stories that we have. You don't hear these stories every day. And I really like this quote for two reasons. One is, this is that intimate knowledge of life in the community. Because who knew in 1992 that there were support groups going into Muslim mosques educating people on HIV? Who knew that there was a support group for women and that this in one, in, in one family there was a, a Muslim man who had HIV who, uh, whose mother helped him do his daily prayers? And you know, this is something that was in our archive. This is before we started our Muslims in Brooklyn project. But I like this also because the um, oh, sorry, okay, because of the lessons that it gives us as oral history practitioners. And I just want to touch on some of these lessons because I think they're instructive for the work that we're doing. And that is when we do oral histories. Uh, we, we, con we consider the authority of the oral history shared authority, that the story belongs to the narrator and to the interviewer. They are co-creators of this story. And so that the narrator is always a part owner of the story, that we should not be colonizers, where we go extract stories from these communities and turn them into produced whatever we turn them into, and then re introduce them to the communities to consume. That every step of the way, uh, the narrators, the people who source our stories should uh, have a role uh, with us. The second is consent. In oral histories, there is something called informed consent. We talk with our narrators before we even do the interview. We discuss the parameters of what the interview will cover. What subjects do they feel comfortable covering? What subjects do they not want to cover? We have them sign a release form giving us permission to use the oral history. We transcribe the oral history, return it back to them for a second review. We've had people ask us to pull their, their interview. We've had people ask us to redact portions of the interview. And we allow this because an oral history interview is not a journalistic interview. It is not a gotcha interview. It is a facilitated conversation that allows someone the opportunity to remember their life for not just their benefit, but for our benefit as well. The third point is listening. And there's a lot of you know, focus on uh, storytelling, but I want us to think about story listening. The listening is an as active a part of the storytelling experience as the actual telling. If there is no listener, there is no story to be heard. Uh, attached to that or going along with that is the point of access. If you have a wonderful story and no one can find it, it is as though it does not exist. And so it is very important that whatever projects we support, 
in storytelling that we ensure that there is access. And I don't mean access just in terms of the short term, but that's really important because a lot of the narrative change work is about what we can produce now. But I also wanted th us to think about uh, access in the long term with preservation, that we not just focus on changing the narrative today with these stories, but we focus on changing the narrative 10 years from now, 20 years from now, by the archive that we create. Because the way knowledge is produced, we know people go into the archives, people produce books, they produce scholarship, and we are creating the new uh, source material, the data from which the scholars will define life for Muslims in America. And so the, the other reason why I like playing or, or highlighting this 1992 clip is that was from you know, 30, uh, 20, uh, 26 years ago. And it's still with us today. It's still a kernel of a story that we can explore. In our project, um, you know, I, I'm going to highlight some of the my favorite colleagues in their their uh, work. Um, one of my colleagues, Swad Abdul Kabir, she tweeted this in 2017, and you can see how popular this tweet was because it really resonated. Which is, you don't need to be a voice for the voiceless; just pass the mic. And this is the understanding that we we don't talk about giving voice to the voiceless when we talk about highlighting these stories. We talk about amplifying. We talk about listening. We talk about broadcasting. The voices exist, whether they're figurative or literal, uh, that people have something to say. What they do need and what we do need is more listening. So the project that, it, that, that we've been working on called Muslims in Brooklyn has been designed to help us amplify the stories of Muslims in Brooklyn. And we are, um, by our resources, we can only do 50 interviews. Uh, because we have to, I, we go through this process. It's labor intensive, it's resource intensive to transcribe and to process and make these, these uh, interviews available. And for this, we are very grateful for the support that we have received by, by some of you in this room. And for those of you who have not yet supported, we welcome more support. Um, but the, we, we're doing um, 50 oral histories. And the oral histories will be the basis of an arts exhibition. It'll be the basis of a school curriculum. It will be the basis of several uh, public programs. And the reason why we have kind of stru structured it this way is because of these issues of access. Um, we know that one of the most important times in people's development in terms of their attitudes and opinions are young people. And so we knew that we have to take these stories and transform them in a, a curriculum that can be used in the schools. Um, we also, you know, we've, we've engaged an artist, um, some of you may be familiar with Camila Janan Rashid, who will be developing our exhibition. And one of the first things Camila said to me when we presented her this project, she said, why, why 50 interviews? Like, why only 50? And so that's why I want us to think beyond the issues of representation, because we can't represent all by our limited resources. So we think of the 50 not as the ceiling, but as the floor. We are, 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 are cataloging these stories not to satisfy your curiosity, but to inspire it. We don't want people coming away from the stories that we present thinking, aha, I know what there is to know about Muslims. We want them coming away from the stories we present thinking, wow. I need to know more about Muslims. And I think when we think of our projects, we want to think that way. Quickly, some other points. Um, I'm using this um, cultural diamond, which was developed by sociologist Wendy Griswold, to talk about how art interacts with the creator, the audience, and the social context. And I think it's important for us when we think of the story, that we think of the story as having these other components. That a story experience is actually the experience of a relationship. That if you are a listener, that you, are, you have a relationship with the actual story, you have a relationship with the storyteller, and you have a relationship with the context in which you are receiving that story. If you're the storyteller, you have those same kinds of relationships. The, and so the reason why this is important is because in terms of oral histories, uh, we see oral histories as cataloging or documenting two histories simultaneously. It documents the history that people are recalling from the past, but it also documents the moment in which they're making that remembrance. And the reason why that's so important is because while we were doing this project, in the week of June uh, 27th, uh, a Jew, yes, the Muslim ban 
uh, was upheld by the Supreme Court. And this fundamentally transformed the kind of stories we were getting. So that we had to make note of that. And part of making note of that is being an institution that is, in the spirit of listening, affirming the voice of the narrators, affirm, affirming the lives of the narrators. And I want to say that you know, when we um, support these projects or we seek to fund these projects, think about the kind of extended support that you can give to these community organizations or other uh, grantees who may not have experience working in these communities. We had a little experience working in these communities, but we were fortunate and, you know, I have to say um, the Doris Duke Foundation through their media training with Rethink Media, we were, we were at the training when this um, a ban was upheld and it just had us in the mindset to how, how we should respond. And immediately our leadership, um, some of whom are here with me today, said we have to issue a statement. And that statement um, was a statement on the Muslim ban. And this was really, I consider, quite radical for an institution like Brooklyn Historical Institution, a cultural institution, to issue a statement celebrating and affirming the lives of Muslims in Brooklyn. Um, so I think that when um, we talk about the transformative role of these stories, I think that is what I want us to think about. Um, finally, I want us to be mindful that not only do these stories transform the, 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 the mass public, but they also transform the, the actual communities themselves. And again, this is, we don't want to have this colonizer approach to these stories where we go in, we take these stories, and we never maintain a relationship with the communities. And so I want to leave you with um, part of a statement that was read at a, a public gathering by one of the um, narrators who will be part of our connect, uh, collection, Shahana Hanif. And, you know, she said, you know, I was born and raised in Brooklyn right here in Kensington. My faith practices are situated in Brooklyn. I was interviewed for the Muslims in Brooklyn series, uh, which, by the way, will be available to the public. I felt powerful and free telling my story. Oral historian Liz Strong, my colleague who interviewed her, and I were in recording for more than two hours in conversation about my early life in Brooklyn, faith and religious community experiences, community organizing, disability and gender justice, feminism, contributions as a writer, and more. Oral history is impactful in witnessing significant stories. Muslims in Brooklyn is a contribution that will live forever and serve as a tool to realize and conceptualize what Muslim life was, is, and could be. Thank you for your commitment in never hear, having to hear our stories don't exist. The stories don't exist. We have to go. We have to find them. We have to listen. We have to provide access to them. We have to preserve them. Thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. If you have any questions for Zahij, um, we can share a mic with you. Or you can speak actually from your seats because your mic is turned on. Just oh. has a question. So, so here I'm really taken with the fact of authentic stories and needing to talk beyond Islamophobia. How do we, so as researchers, we can sort of sit in that position and take that analytic category. But working with people in the community, sometimes they're very much aware of being viewed as Muslim. How do you get them to go beyond trying to frame what they think is acceptable or the gaze that they're constantly under. How do you get them to move beyond that, to get those authentic stories? So our approach is life history. Um, and we, you know, because we're doing Brooklyn, um, and, you know, it's interesting. Some people that we've approached with this project, they're like, why just Brooklyn? I'm like, really? Why just Brooklyn? But <laughs> shout out to Brooklyn. But the, the reason why um, we're doing uh, is that we found like the hyper-local approach. And I mean hyper-local, like down to the individual, 
right? Um, the more specific you get is actually the more universal you get. And so what we find is people are talking about growing up. They're talking about coming of age. They're talking about going to school. They're talking about the crushes they had. I mean, you know, Islam doesn't always come into play in the most explicit ways. Uh, when you drill down, when you go into that hyper-local, hyper-individual experience. And that's why I kind of want to move away from the, you know, the, the, the problem with the frame of representation is that it places this burden on a single individual to tell everybody's story. And we're like, no, we don't want everybody's story. We want just your specific story. Because in your specific story, that's where you find that authenticity. And you know, of course there is you know, a, a, a bit of a, uh, let's say, construction that happens in, the, in storytelling is a performance. Um, and some people do it way better than others. I personally kind of shy away from interviewing um, very public figures because they're very practiced in a kind of, this is my story and this is what I want you to know about me. But even with those folk, there are things that you can find. You know, I interviewed this one gentleman gave this wonderful story. Um, he was someone who embraced Islam in the 1960s. And, you know, in the course of the interview, and he's doing it like, you know, Islam is great. And it's great, right? And I said, I said, I noticed that you talked about a little bit about your and this is at the end of the interview. Sometimes the best thing happens when you're about to shut the recorder off. Anyone who's doing oral histories, don't ever shut the recorder off until you walk out the door. And I said to him, I said, you know, it's interesting. You talked a little bit about your parents at the beginning and how they were like, you know, officials in the church. And I said, you know, what did your parents think of your spiritual journey? And he just like paused for like, three minutes it felt like, and this is the other thing when you're doing oral history, be comfortable with silence. Give people space to breathe. Give people space to think. Let people feel comfortable with silence, which we're not usually comfortable with. And he told me this beautiful story about his father driving with him and asking him all of these questions about what he believed. And he said, you know, he was like, you believe in Jesus, right? And he tells his father, that, yes, but he clarifies in what context. And he said, that's what I thought. I had to correct the pastor this Sunday. And so he asked his father, like, what do you, what do you believe about Jesus? And it's very similar to the son. And he's like, you know, that's what we believe. And he's like, why didn't you ever think about becoming Muslim? And his father says, because I like the church music. So, <laughs> so you hear this, like, really beautiful story um, and embedded it. It, it. You know, like, there's a layer of, like, the... Um, what we would consider the proselytizing about like what Islam means and what it doesn't mean and how we view what Christians view. But beneath that, it's a father-son relationship, right? That this is two people who are, are basically driving, having this conversation. And so that's what I mean by drilling down, you know, moving away from the burden of representation is how we get to the authentic experience, the human experience, which is what I think helps bridge the gap of empathy, which is one of the most powerful things that storytelling can do, um, is allow people to place themselves in the circumstances that they're hearing about. And you do that by you know, touching on what we would consider these universal experiences that we all have. Um, yes, and then. Could you talk a little bit about how you find and select the people you talk with, um, since especially you only have 50? Yes. Um, you should see our spreadsheet. <laughs> um, the, you know, we, we did research. Um, we talked to community activists. We talked to community leaders. We did a kind of canvassing. You know, what are the stories that you think are important? Um, who are people who, are, who you think would be interested in talking with us? So we, we canvassed. Um, but we were very cognizant of trying to make sure that even though, to you know, my last point about not wanting to have this like burden of representation, we knew that we wanted the collection to be intersectional. Um, and so we wanted to present that. So we paid attention to geography. We paid attention to where in Brooklyn people lived. We paid attention to nationality. We paid attention to ethnicity. We paid attention to gender. We paid attention to gender identity, to sexual orientation, to age. Uh, 
to tradition, you know, whether it's Sunni or Shia or Ahmadiyya or Five Percent or Nation of Islam or anything like that, um, we paid attention to level of observance, people who were observant to people who were not observant, people who visibly read as Muslim and people who don't. Um, so it's as much as we weren't trying to be representative, we, we do, and you know, we, we didn't get everyone. Right, and that's why I said, you know, the 50 is the floor, not the ceiling. Right? I, I, if people, I want people to come away from this collection not thinking that they have um, consumed the full totality of Muslims in Brooklyn, but to one, be made aware how much they don't know and be more curious to know more. Mm -hmm. I think there was a question here. I came in a little late, so I hope we didn't cover this. But this is this is the work you do is so important. To what extent has it permeated the history institutions, the, the historical societies and the, and the oral historians' ways of working? Are you in the forefront or are you capturing something that's going on? So I think that um, we've been fortunate that um, my institution, Brooklyn Historical Society, is one of the leading institutions when it comes to oral history. Um, we have a, a well-established reputation for our oral history projects. Um, in fact, this weekend in Montreal at the Oral History Association, we've convened a panel on collecting Muslim oral histories. And we have been in communication with our peer institution at the Chicago History Museum, the Studs Terkel Oral History Center. They're doing a project called Muslims in Chicago. Um, and there are several other kinds of projects like that. Um, I think in terms of the impact, you know, we have um, assembled an advisory committee that includes scholars in you know, kind of traditional uh, academic circles. And we plan to work with them for the outreach of, of this project. I just came back from the University of Michigan a couple of weeks ago where I gave a talk based on the work that we've been doing. Uh, we've also been impactful in kind of broad journalism. Um, Slate.com has a series called Who's Afraid of Ayman Ishmael? Um, and it's a series to battle Islamophobia. And they approached us and said, you know, do you have any interesting stories? And we gave them some examples and they seized upon one on the history of the Muslim bean pie, which is a dessert developed in the African-American Muslim community. And there was a bakery in Bed-Stuy. I had interviewed the baker, the founder, and his son. And I introduced them to the Slate team because I wasn't going to hand over my interviews uh, because it's a different style of interviewing. I said, you know, I, I talked to the narrators. Are you interested in talking to Slate.com? And they said yes. And they did a story. And the video has been viewed over 4.2 million times on Facebook and shared over 50,000 times. So that gives you a sense of both the deep resonance of these kinds of stories can have. And, and I'm very happy to say like this started with our oral history. Um, I'm, I'm working right now to talk to, especially in light of the Pop Culture Collaborative's report, um, talking to the creative community. I've been a, a part of some of the convenings that the Pop Culture Collaborative has had about what are the ways that we can make these stories accessible and, and effectively accessible to the creative community as a source. You know, when you talk to um, producers who refield complaints about the representation of Muslims in their programming, some will say, well, we're just getting our stories from the headlines, right? That's their authenticity. That's their representation. And we want to say, well, there, there are a whole lot of other stories, too. Thank you, Samir. I wish we had more time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs>